Hello, this is Reverend Christy Hardwick and welcome to Wisdom Wednesdays, the Consciousness Cafe. Today I'm really excited to be here with John Bunker. I ran into John in a place called Truro, Massachusetts. He was giving a lecture about apples and I had no idea that a person could give a lecture about apples, but I happened to know one of his relatives, so I said, let's go see what this is all about. So I was mesmerized, amazed, and I still talk about that talk and tell people some of the things I learned about apples that I never knew. So this is John who has over 400 trees that are on his own property, which represent almost as many varieties. And he's been tending to apples and learning and growing apples for 49 years. And some people call him the apple whisperer. John Bunker, welcome. Thank you very much. Christy. <laughs> and so fun to have this conversation. So first, let's just find out how did this happen? 49 years ago, you got this property and then? Well, I, I uh, knew that I wanted to go and live uh, in a rural area in the woods. And I, during college, I was the one that had the VW bus. And so when my classmates decided they were going to go pick apples and make cider, they insisted that I go along because I had the vehicle that was required. So, so I was like the kid with the baseball mitts and the bat, you know, that became very popular. So we pressed cider. And, uh, and I also knew where there was an old orchard um, because I had been spending, I had spent a lot of my childhood in central Maine. And, uh, and that intrigued me. Um, I enjoyed it, it was fun. I never forgot it. Of course, here I am talking about it. Now that was probably 50, you know, three years ago or whatever. And towards the end of college, I purchased a very inexpensive piece of property that cost about as much as a used car. And, um, but land was very inexpensive so many years ago. And, uh, and then moved here and built a little house and started to poke around town to see what was going on. And one of the things that I noticed was, uh, were these ancient apple trees. Everywhere. How did you know they were ancient apple trees? Because they were they were big and hollow and sometimes had huge branches broken off them and they were in patterns in people's yards so I could begin to to guess it turned out I was correct that these were small farm orchards that were these were not something that like the commercial orchards of today, these were like half a dozen trees maybe in a pattern in somebody's yard. And I also immediately began to notice that these were apples that I had never seen before. I thought there was red apples and green apples. I didn't yes, know. Exactly. I have my little, my little apple here. It's yeah, a, there's a red one. <laughs> it's a, they call it a gala, whatever that means. And I'm familiar <laughs> with this and, a, and a, the green ones and maybe bigger bright red ones. I would say maybe there's three, right. you know, occasionally no, I guess yeah. I've seen a yellow a few times. So maybe I can stretch it to saying, you know, half a dozen apples I could say I've seen. And you saw something different on these trees. Yes, and I didn't really know what I was seeing. And, um, but I began to think that I needed to know what these were because they weren't just those red apples that I remembered from bobbing for apples in Halloween and junior high or something or elementary school. Um, these were different. And, um, and I, just, I just needed to know more. And I also, um, I'm a visual person and, uh, and, I, and these were beautiful. You know, that not only were they red and yellow and green, they were also red and yellow and browns and purples and big and small and fat and skinny and conic and so forth and so on. And uh, so I would became fascinated with them. And also I was young 
and um, I was in my early 20s and it was free food. And, and I'd drive down the road and there would be an apple tree and there'd be apples all over the grass. No one seemed to want them. And so I'd stop in and say hello and knock on the door and say, do you want your apples? And they'd say, no, no, just take them. So I had cardboard boxes and bags and I'd go out and I'd collect them. And then they'd come out and they'd tell me about the old varieties. And it would be like grandma and grandpa who were still living at the house while their kids who also lived there, who were my parents' age, they were off at work at, at, in Augusta or at, the, or at the shipyard in Bath or somewhere. But the grandparents who often lived with their children and grandchildren, they knew. And so they'd come out and they'd say, oh, yeah, this is a Baldwin. We would use these for pies or this kept all winter. Or, this was a Wolf River or a Northern Spy or whatever. Oh, and so wow, wow. So you just learn. You were in school in such a natural way by just being curious yes. and fascinated about what you were seeing and how wonderful that you got the legacy of these apples from the people who actually had been living with them and using them and gave you all these new names and varieties. That's wow. Yes, and what eventually happened was that as I got more deeply into it, I began to uh, come to the conclusion that many of these old varieties of which I realized they were not only dozens, but hundreds of different varieties, many of these were, were, uh, were dying out. And, uh, and, and, and in many cases, even the old timers who I met didn't know what they were anymore. And so I, and then some of them I realized, I, I came to learn, originated in Maine because every apple variety originates somewhere. And, and so many of these were originating in Maine. And I realized that I could make a contribution that I didn't think anyone else was making. And I was gonna love doing it while I did it. Wow, that's just, I wanna pause there for a second because what a beautiful thing. It's, you know, just by chance with your friends, you're out and you're picking apples and you get fascinated by this. And this fascination and curiosity leads you to what becomes really a major contribution to the world by being able to say, I now understand a lot of things about apples. And one of the things I wanna bring up about that because your wealth is just, we could possibly touch the, the an inch of it in the time that we have. But one of the things you said that fascinated me so much in your studies about apples was you said, an apple, the seeds inside of it don't necessarily make the apple that you're eating. And I thought, how could that be? Everything else we learn about seeds is that if you plant this seed, you're going to get that if you plant this seed. And then all of a sudden the paradigm was broken when you talked to, about the apple seed and grafting and how apples actually become what they are. Can you say a little bit about that? The seeds, uh, apple seeds are like human beings. So every seed in every apple that ever was has a mother and a father, a biological mother and a biological father, just like every human has a bio, has one of each. And so, um, so every seed becomes a unique combination of the genetics of the mother and the father. So just like I have three biological siblings with the same mother and the same father, but each of us is different. We are, we are a, a, a different mix up or whatever, a different combo of those genetics of our, of our mother and our father. The same is true for every seed in every apple that ever was. So if you have, you were talking about gala, which is a variety that originated in New Zealand, or I think it's in New Zealand, that if you took that, uh, if you had a, gala tree in your yard, every apple on that tree will always be gala. But every seed in that, in every gala apple from that tree will produce from seed an apple tree that will be new and unique. It will resemble gala, 
but it will be like you if you have siblings. You resemble them, but you're not the same unless you're an identical twin. And with apples, you don't get identical twins. So every seed and every apple that ever was will yield a brand new unique individual, just like every human is a unique individual. And that's one of the many, many things that we share in common with the apples. So people wanna know, how do, how do you get a gala tree? Well, you can't get it from planting a gala seed. You can get it from grafting. And that's where, when we talk about grafting and grafted trees, that's where that comes from. And when you graft a gala, you take a little teeny snippet of a uh, branch of the gala, just a little piece about the size of a pen top, and you splice it, that's the graft, onto what's called a rootstock, and then you get a gala tree. So you can have you can have an orchard with a million gala trees if you want, but they're all grafted. So when you go to a commercial orchard, to a you pick orchard and you and you uh, go pick apples or, you, or whatever, every tree has been grafted. That's amazing. It sounds <laughs> to me like a little bit like the um, winemaking business that you know, they talk about the vines and and being able to you know make wine it's not like the seed of the grape it's it's the vine it's really fascinating yes um many fruits are propagated either by grafting or by cuttings and grapes are done both ways they're done by cuttings or by grafting oh. <laughs> but the fun so 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 i've spent um all these years tracking i say tracking down identifying and preserving rare historic varieties, primarily the ones that were yeah. grown in Maine. Tracking, and identifying, and preserving. Re pres preserving, right. And the way to preserve them is not from the seed, it's from the grafts. So when we find a, a, new, tr a new old tree, a new ancient tree, um, then one of the first things I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come back to that tree in the winter maybe even before I've identified it, take some cuttings from it, some scions, they're called S-C-I-O-N, and then graft that tree. And once it's grafted, it is now protected. Is so it it's continue? All tree, yeah. So it's like, it's like the baton in a relay race mm -hmm. or the torch in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And um, in the relay race, you take the baton from the last runner and then you pass it on mm -hmm. to the next runner. And with grafting and with these old varieties, these varieties were passed down from generation to generation to generation, sometimes for hundreds of years, sometimes only within a, one town or one county, mm -hmm. because these are, these are what we would call heirlooms because they are, they are coveted and cherished in, in, some, in some cases, as I say, just in one town or one area where they really thrived. And many of these are like the best pie apples, the wow. best sauce yeah. apples, the best apples for making a cake or make or baking them or, or even eating fresh. Beyond and our imagination, there's so many that I, I, I'm flabbergasted by how many things I want to taste now. And if you can believe it, we've you know, spent you know, just a few minutes talking together, but I want to ask you one more question, which I'm just fascinated by. You may not even be able to answer it, but you obviously uh, spend a lot of time with apples. You started out, you said, with cider, right? Making cider. What kind of things do you do with apples now? And do you have any kind of favorites? Well, with, you know, if you figure that every apple is unique like your children, then I probably have 350 varieties or whatever. So it's like I have 350 children. Fortunately, I don't, but, um, but uh, and so, you know, for those people who have more than one child, I would say, which one do you love the best? Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's impossible to say, yeah. but for different things, for different uses, I have favorites and, um, and the, the, uh, the way that I eat apples the most now actually is in applesauce. And, um, and I make it almost every day. 
which sounds like a horrendous task, but it's not if you make it with five or six apples in a little saucepan. And I have a little hand mill where I can just, you know, crank it and it goes through. And, and so I can have fresh applesauce every morning with my oatmeal. And if you eat, if you eat the uh, apples fresh, it'd be hard to eat five or six apples in a day. You probably end up with a bellyache. But if you cook them into sauce, you can easily eat five or six apples a day. So I, I love them in sauce. That's the way I like them the best. And also some of the apples that you eat fresh that taste really odd, or even you don't really like the flavor. If you cook them, they're delicious. So, so, you know, try eating a raw potato someday. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so, uh, so many of these apples with very interesting flavors and textures really cook really well. That's the way I like them the best. I also do make cider and I drink cider and, and they, uh, that's another way that you can consume a lot of apples. So I like to consume lots. So I tend to cook them and drink them. Those are, those are more, than, more than an apple a day. More and than an apple a day, as many you as you can do. Vital and uh, excited and passionate about the work that you're doing. And I just love learning about it. And I'm definitely gonna, after we finish speaking, go have myself an apple. And I do <laughs> bake sometimes with apples. I don't like to use any sugar. So I use applesauce as the sweetener in a lot of the baking oh, yeah, that I yeah. do. Yeah. They're just they're versatile and wonderful in that way, right? Yes, and, and applesauce, no spices, no sugar, no, just, you just want, you want the apple, the flavor of that apple. Beautiful. That's, Beautiful. that's what you want. That's Your recipe you want. for applesauce then is not with the cinnamon and not with lemon, not with any, just the apples. Apples. And, apples. And, and enough water so that you don't, you don't destroy your pan. <laughs> there you go. Beautiful. Well, it's been such a joy to spend a few minutes with you and learn more about apples and how we and, you know, apples are alike in some ways. It's just amazing. And I wish you all the best and all those varieties in your 400, you know, apple children that they remain vibrant and that more and more people um, get on the get on board with planting the old varieties. That's beautiful. Thank you, John. Well, thank you very much, Christine.